How's how's everybody doing? Good. Ow. Meh. Only meh, Austin? Only meh? Uh, the Ravens won, so we got to bask in Taylor's sadness. Yes. It was it was I could taste it over the internet. I didn't even watch the Super Bowl yesterday. There was just like a point in time in the evening where I was like, Oh yeah. Yeah, that that's Taylor's disappointment right there. <laughs> How did it taste to you? It was like it was salty with a, with a hint of bitterness. I I think uh, the best way to put it would be uh, chewing on sour grapes. I didn't watch the Super Bowl, but I had to experience the aftermath because um, I live in Baltimore, and it was horrible. My my norm they, I I work late on weekends, and so I was you know coming home around midnight. And which usually, which is normally like a 25 to 28 minute drive home, took an hour and a half because not only was there traffic, you know, in the traditional sense, but people decided to just run into the streets and have block parties in the two right lanes. And it was just, I, I, I seriously almost committed vehicular man- manslaughter like four times. I, I say that jokingly, but seriously, I, I, how are people not dead right now? I'm almost positive some people got, got seriously hurt. They were just running around in the street. It was it was like it was like a very happy riot. That's what it was like. No, nobody, nobody was actually looting. It was just it was just chaos. The only good the only good thing that came out of it, I feel, um, is that normally I have sort of a a fear, a little, a little bit of a phobia of police officers. Even though I'm not doing anything wrong, when they're nearby, I just get really tense and 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 itchy and and, and scared. But I was really happy to see them because there were it was like there were more police officers out there than there were people on Earth. It was just like this giant police state of them trying their very best to help me, help get us through traffic and and keep everyone on the sidewalk where they should be. But they weren't. Why can't they just party on the sidewalk? I don't understand that. Your, your team that you're very loosely connected with won a game. Party on the sidewalk. You don't have to run up to my car and start smacking my antenna. Stop smacking my antenna. Why are you doing that? Stop pointing at me, too. Everyone kept pointing at me like, yeah, we did it. I was like, no, I'm not part of this at all. I wish you lost. See, Lee, I think you're mi- you're missing a crucial component here, and that is drugs and alcohol that were involved. Because I I was at like a college party watching this, so it was like 30 people in a tiny ass room. Funny story, uh, 30 people don't fit in a tiny ass room, so we actually stole a couch <laughs> from some from somewhere else, jammed it into this dorm to get everyone in, and but the couch blocked the bathroom. So guess what? We're on the eighth floor. People are peeing off the roof of this dormitory at Florida State. And it's just, this is it was the most irresponsible thing I've ever witnessed, and it was glorious. Well, it, that sounds horrible, but y'all are just kids. I mean, I was, I was like grown-ass men running in the streets. It was, it was I, I've never had more contempt for humanity than, than last night. It was, it was really just horrible. I just, just I, I, I started to hate the place of my birth. Just, just because I, I just, I just started to just genuinely hate Baltimore on my drive home through Baltimore to my home in Baltimore. Eat, eat a bag of dicks, Baltimore, and then, <laughs> and then, and then eat me. Eat so much of me. Cannibalism. Sports. <laughs> Johnny's like, I don't know anything about hockey riots. People, that was like a violent riot, though. Actually, I was, I was just telling Leon before you yeah. arrived here, Austin, that today in Vancouver we had our first court case. Like, and this is, I think this is fascinating. Apparently, the Vancouver Police Department has won like international awards for the policing that they've done to like track down participants in in the riots. They like got a bunch of mobile footage, you know, like people recording on their cell phones, television footage, everything, and they've been using like recognition software to track people down and we had the first we had the first trial case today began in Vancouver and i am proud to say that the caliber of people involved in these riots so far exceeded my estimations of their mental capacity that the first guy today had the gall to come to the like come to the defendant stand with his defense being yes i'm pretty sure that's me in the video 
I don't know, I can't remember, I was a bit drunk. That sounds about right, but I mean... What, as, like a, Leon was, as a legal defense? <laughs> no, just the truth. You're supposed to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. That's about right. I can't, I can't argue know, with that. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is, is that it'll, probably like a month from now, he's going to be like, wait a minute. Oh, I should have gone with the I didn't do it testimony. <laughs> I, I appreciate the honesty, but you see what I'm saying? Like, Leon was like, it was like a happy riot. Everyone was just so happy, but, I yeah. mean, people were, like, setting shit on fire in Vancouver, weren't I, they? I know that. I know that. Canadians so, are an angry bunch. It's because it's all repressed. They, it's so repressed. It is so repressed. There is, like, there is no Holocaust in this world quite like taking a Canadian to bed, because that's where it all gets worked out. It's wow. It's a horrific scene. Don't sleep with Canadians. You guys, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on it. Now I'm scared. There, there's a quote. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it's okay if you're Canadian because then it like it kind of cancels out. There's this kind of like mutual anger fuck that goes on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another weekly edition of A Motion Picture is Worth a Thousand Words, where myself, your host, Johnny Maloney, and my compatriots, Leon Thomas and Austin Yorsky, uh, review the descriptive video tracks uh, to popular movies and television shows. Uh, it should be noted for any new listeners here, we do not actually review the content, uh, we just review the descriptive video track. So no dialogue, uh, no talk of plot, what's actually going on screen. Just whether or not we feel descriptive video uh, has the adequate amount of effort and art put into it to properly lead the audience into these heart-wrenching stories and wonderful tales that, uh, that come to us. Today we're going to be having a look at Steven Spielberg's War Horse. Uh, so, first of all, we're going to begin with uh, a, a little reading of a transcript from the, uh, the descriptive video track of War Horse, and then we're going to discuss at great length. Uh, so, we begin. <clears throat> uh, War Horse. The War Horse runs. He continues running. A soldier shoots. A child cries. Michael Fassbender looks incredibly handsome. The War Horse continues to run. He jumps! And continues running. Steven Spielberg wants you to feel something. Feel something. I'm feeling something right now, Johnny. You know what I'm feeling? What are you feeling, Austin? Confusion, anger, uh, a little hungry. Yeah. You know what? You you know when you said the child cries? Well, that's your Oscar moment right there. Well, that's you know. I mean, let's let's be honest here. Uh, trying to uh, you know write a proper descriptive video for a Steven Spielberg movie obviously includes children crying and him asking you to feel something because the horse is innocent, but he's at war. It's a war horse. He runs more How children you, but, crying. Was anyone looking, especially looking up? That seems to Benedict be Benedict Cumberbatch. That... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why, why do we always assume that animals are innocent? You don't know what's going on in that horse's mind. It that could be like a kill you. He would, it could be like a serial killer rapist, for right all you for know. The fucking neck. But yes, Leon, to answer your question, yes, uh, a child with wet cheeks looks up as the horse leaps majestically in the background. A fist is raised in the air, not in hate, but in triumphant solidarity. Feel something. I once Spielberg read. A, loves you. The end. I want. I once uh, I read a description of Steven Spielberg's uh, films in general, and with, with rare exception, they seem to be all about making you feel like a child so that you don't que question why is it a more significant film. I can see that. Yeah. It simply explains why this descriptive video track talks down to me. <laughs> so what, what was that about Fassbender? Does he get his junk out? Because I, I hear that's a thing that happens in a lot of movies, and I'm interested in seeing that. I don't know. I don't remember. I, I have Which even a Which one is Fassbender? He was Do I in, know uh, him? He, he was in X Men First Class. I think he played uh, a younger Magneto. Oh, okay, him. I'm, I, 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 sometimes I can't put names to faces if, if it's like a new actor that I, you know, that just came or started coming up uh, in the last few years or so. If you ever find yourself walking across, like, by some fast that is being bent, it is likely it is Michael Fassbender. Thank you for that. 
just doing my job. Yeah, I think he was in um, Prometheus recently. But oh, yeah. oh, 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 okay. I always think of him as the guy from Shame, which is some movie where you see his dong for like 10 minutes. He just stands there? Yeah. Wait a minute, is it, is, is, is it 10 minutes? Wait a minute, is it 10 minutes straight, or is it like several non-consecutive scenes added up to 10 minutes? I haven't actually seen it. That's just the reputation of the movie, so that's what I associate him with. Describe okay. to me in great detail how long you've stared at Michael Fassbender's <laughs> wiener. Not long enough, apparently. Well, you should remedy that, I think. I'll get around to it. Good, good. Well, I, I'm sorry, I lost what we are talking about. Scripted video tracks. What the hell is that? Is people just narrate like the events? Uh, it's it's designed. The descriptive video track is is designed for people who are you know like have difficulty with their sight. <clears throat> it it essentially describes the action that's going on screen while being as least dis disruptive to the dialogue as possible. Um, and I like sometimes just for shits and giggles, I I turn them on after having watched a movie to actually compare what it is that, that the narrator is like describing and, and to see if it like matches up with what I might imagine. Like the strangest experience I ever had was watching like three quarters of, Oh God, I don't even remember the name of the movie now. Um, it's the one about, um, the, the Jewish hitmen squads that go after the people who, who killed the Israeli Olympic Olympian hostages? Munich. Munich. Yes, thank yeah. you, thank you. That was, that, was a, that was a mature Spielberg film. Yeah, yeah. No, watching watching Munich with the descriptive video on was one of the weirdest movie-going experience. Well, not movie-going, but like movie-watching experiences I've ever had in my entire life. They even went out of their way to visually describe the Universal Studios logo. It's like the movie started, and immediately this guy was like, a sliver of light appears in the blackness. Pretty, it's like, a sliver of light appears in the blackness. It is soon revealed that we are, in fact, in space. The Earth spins below us, and as light cascades across the surface of the Earth, a logo begins to circle round in orbit in bright gold letters. It glows universal. I was like, whoa, that was some super drama. I can't wait till we actually get to the movie. And I'm just kind of curious if, like, anybody who was watching that who needed descriptive video, if they were like, I thought I was watching Munich, not a sci-fi movie. Johnny, do you use these opening bits to just discuss things that just happened to you recently? Are you just sitting there? Happened in your years ago. This was like, Munich was like when it, when it first came out on rentals, when people still did things like go to stores and rent DVDs. Yeah, Munich so was you, like you, seven years ago, I think. So you've been holding that grudge for seven years, Johnny? No, no, not especially. But, you know, I just, I was reminded of it. So you want to talk about video games now, or... <sighs> if we have to. I don't, I don't know. So that's a thing we could do. I, st I still gotta talk about the games I played last week that we didn't get time to go over. Well, do we want, do we want to start with that? You can, you can do that. Seems like a place to start. I mean, you've, you've started already, so... Finish it! <laughs> no, I wish I'd played Mortal Kombat some so I could, I could segue... All right, so if you guys listened to the show last week, I played, like, seven games. I only got a chance to talk about a couple. Fuck those guys that host that show. I can't stand them. <laughs> Especially the guy with the, with the whiny nerd voice. Yeah, the guy who's got a weirdly nerd voice that I just cannot put up with. God, he's obnoxious. I don't even remember his name. Joan? Jordan? Something like Fuck. Fuck that guy. If he Idiot. was so devish, devilishly handsome, I'd say that he has nothing to offer humanity. Continue. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, clearly. Um... So another game I played last week, uh, Little Big Planet 2. Oh. Uh, yes. If you guys are readers of the site, you know that Little Big Planet 2 is one of the only games we've ever given a perfect 10 and our highest recommendation to. I think that joins uh, Radiant Historia, Red Dead Redemption, and maybe Tactics Ogre. I was I think our... really excited when people started to say Little Big, because then I think they're going to say Adventure, and I'm like, somebody remembers those games! And then they say Planet, and I'm like, oh. I think I... Maybe I'm just projecting. Do I? Is there a Little Big Planet adventure that I remember, or is no, this no, just a thing? There, there are like some old games called Little Big Adventure uh. and Little Big Adventure Two. Okay, I'll look into that because that sounds familiar. But maybe, maybe you're just like planting the seed of me knowing that. Anyway, so Little Big Planet Two. Uh, if you guys read my review of Little Big Planet Vita, you know that I'm a big fan of the series already. It's it's whimsical and it has a great art style. And yeah, has... the main character's name is Sackboy. 
It's sack thing, you sexist bastard. It can be sack boy or sack girl. Don't you don't you fucking bring your gender binaries in here, you heteronormative motherfucker. That's me. Is, is it serious <laughs> is it seriously sack well, like, thing? Because I don't know. Here, that's just like man, I'm so outdated. <laughs> Actually I think the narrator says sack thing because you can you can dress oh. him up as a boy or a girl. Well that's, that's better. Fucking the inimitable um I've forgotten his name. I can't believe that. Stephen Fry? Stephen Fry, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Johnny? Yeah, Stephen Fry is the narrator. The, this, these games have personality to spare, and I, I think I'll just cut right to the chase. It is a really good thing for Nintendo that Little Big Planet was so late to the 2D platformer party, because if they had debuted at the same time, I think Little Big Planet would be the face of video games the way that Mario is. I, I don't think that uh, there's really any comparison between the amount of content that these two games bring. Like, Mario is great. It has, you know, cool levels and all that stuff, but Little Big Planet is fucking enormous in scale. Like, you can play you can play Little Big Planet 2 for the rest of your life because of the user-created content. A lot of it's really high quality, and it's not just platforming. You can make... Someone made Wolfenstein in Little Big Planet. Wolfenstein 3D? I believe so. Oh. Like, you can... It's, it's absolutely ludicrous how great this game is. And it's really, I think this this series is really underappreciated, maybe because it's a platformer in the the shooter age, maybe because it's a Sony exclusive when Sony's kind of lagging behind. I don't know. But the music, the polish, you know, the art style, the the charm, Stephen Fry, the user created, you know, the content tools, all that stuff. Little Big Planet 2 is spectacular. All cynicism Uh, aside, it is really difficult to hate on a game in which people have managed to successfully propose to their girlfriends. Yeah, I think that joins what, like, Minecraft and uh, Borderlands? Portal 2. Portal 2 has had a marriage proposal level in it that that a user made, and actually got Ellen McLean to do the voice for. But uh, Little Big Planet 2, I've seen some marriage proposals as well, and they're adorable. Adorable, I think, is is the word for all of it. Adorbs, yep. And if you read my review, you'll see that I think the Vita version is one of the best games on that platform as well because it actually uses the technology to uh, intuitive effect. If something's in the foreground and you want to push it to the background, you push on the front screen, and vice versa, you push on the back screen to push things to the foreground. It just makes perfect sense. Nothing weird and gimmicky. It's all good. So highest recommendation for that unless you just hate adorable things. In which case, what kind of monster are you? Yeah. We're just going to assume that you kill kittens in your spare time. Leon. In really unseemly ways, too. (laughs) Like, you don't even just end it quickly? Nah, like crucifying. Oh, (laughs) my God. (laughs) Shaving and crucifying kittens. You monster. I didn't even go there. I I get bored. (laughs) (laughs) Holy shit. So that one, that got dark real quick. What else did you play? Oh, uh, what else have I played? Um, I if, if you follow me on the site, you know that I have, like, the most enormous boner for Professor Layton. Okay. You've, Just, got, you've got quite a boner, Austin. It's, it's, <laughs> it's massive and intimidating. But okay. if you also follow the news around the series, you know that the Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright recently came out in Japan to, like, I would say lackluster sales they weren't bad outright they weren't particularly great and that means it might not get localized this makes me sad so i've been playing ace attorney the franchise which is the other half of that one because i haven't finished all of them i'm up to i don't know case three in in justice for all i think it's the name of the game the the, the numbering series the, the numbering of this series is absolutely ludicrous there's like three main games they don't have numbers they just have subtitles and then there's the Apollo Justice one, and then there's, like, the two Edgeworth ones. Like, unless you have a chart, I find that it's pretty much impossible to explain the chronology. I appreciate and then there's a good the, chart. And then there's the one that isn't even out in America because Capcom hates us. So, the one I'm playing right now, I like it. And I feel it's kind of like To the Moon last week, where I'm about to talk a bunch of shit about a game I enjoy. But, you know, these things happen. Um, as, as you probably are aware, Phoenix Wright is a comedy adventure game with puzzle and visual novel aspects. It's basically very linear, and you have to present evidence at the right times to prog- to proceed. The characters are great. The music's great. It has a lot of personality, but the, the logic's pretty fucked in a lot of ways. Um, the best way to get this point across, I think, is with an example. In the one case I was doing last week, 
there was a murder, right? As, as is wont to happen. So I was investigating the crime Wait, scene, and there was a... murder most foul, or murder uh, just kind of foul? Here's the thing. The game is, ev- every single case is murder, but the, the characters are still acting, like, completely, like, Saturday morning cartoon. Like, it's not, <laughs> someone didn't just get their head bashed in, so there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a disconnect there. They're like, we found body parts everywhere. Ha ha ha. So it's sort of got reverse L.A. Noir going on. Because L.A. Noir is like, hey, we found your car in an abandoned lot. That's not my car. Yes, it is, you goddamn whore! You better tell me the straight truth or else I'm going to have you deported! And then I'm going to exhume your mother and have sex with her corpse! <laughs> That's actually a great comparison. L.A. Noir has a, a very similar problem with logic, where either you, the character, know things that you, the player, don't, or vice versa. And it really kind of messes up the flow. And it, it's, it's understandable. It's really hard to write a detective game that gives you kind of the freedom to explore, but also keeps you on track. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, investigation is kind of a difficult, nonlinear thing. It, it pretty to... much relies, in, in my experience, a good investigative game basically relies on passing the player information before the character is required to use that information. It, it's all based on how that info gets passed to the player. So so let me get back to my example here, okay? There was a murder in this case. Uh, as I was investigating the crime scene, I found there was a box, a big-ass suspicious box. I clicked on it, and Phoenix is right. is like, yeah, that's a suspicious box, and that's it. Every time you click on it, that's all I'd say. So I left, and I was like, okay, that box is clearly important, but it's not time to use that box now. So I went to court. Uh, so it was clear to me that the box was important, but none of the options would let me bring it up because he wouldn't. He didn't take note of it. It didn't. It wasn't important to the character. So after that day of the trial, I went back and clicked on it again, and he was still like, "No, that box is really suspicious. I don't have anything to do with it right now, though." And then I went and talked to another character who told me to go check out the box. So I went back after talking to that person, and then he opened the box, and there was like the critical fucking evidence. So it was like I was so far ahead of the character that it made that entire case like agonizing to sit through because I knew what was going on and the character didn't and I had to wait for him to catch up and there was it wasn't even they basically wrote themselves into a corner because there are ways around that but the the way the writing was there there wasn't any way to disguise what was supposed to be happening from us you know what I'm saying it, it very yeah. July- being oblivious, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, you can easily you can easily write that a different way as well. Like you know, you can just be like, "Ooh, the warrant that I have, or whatever, you know, the permissions I have don't clear me to mm, not look at things that are not in plain sight. I can't open this box until I have a reason." It's what's funny is in the next case, something similar happens. There's like a piece of paper in someone's pocket, and uh, you go if you click on it, he's like, "Oh, I shouldn't take evidence from people's pockets or whatever." But, I mean, it's clear that that's important evidence. So, like, sometimes they ha- he has an excuse, sometimes he doesn't. But the thing about the Ace Attorney universe is it takes place, like, it's it's ostensibly completely normal, except it takes place in some kind of, like, future Japan with a really fucked legal system, like, even more fucked than it apparently already is. Like, trials only can go three days. If you can't prove innocence three days, the person's automatically guilty. Uh, you're not allowed to see any of the prosecution's evidence. Uh, I'm trying to think. There's like a bunch of like really arbitrary. Like I, I always joke that like the series is post-apocalyptic and you just never see it <laughs> because it, it's it's all like Mad Max kangaroo court. It's fucked up. But the reason they do that obviously is because they have to fit in within the constraints of the video game. So right. there has to be some pressure on the player. Yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. And also like the for comedy effects. Like there's the the one your your rival prosecutor who has a whip in court and she just like smacks the shit out of you like across the courtroom and she'll hit the judge. She doesn't give a shit and like no one ever calls her on wait, it. Wait, 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 wait. And you don't have to pay her? <laughs> Johnny's like sign me up. Yeah, I, I got to look into these games. <laughs> they're they're really funny. I I like them. They have great characters and most of the most of the stuff goes off without a hitch. I'm just saying like LA Noir, there are some times when the writing puts itself in a hole that it can't get out of without cheating. Yeah. And it's fortunate. Also, the localization, and I don't want to talk too much smack about the, the, the at least the original trilogy because they are uh, like ports of a game from like 10 years ago. But the localization is pretty awful in a lot of places. Like I found just straight out typos. They misspell words. The syntax is completely broken and gibberish. Uh, you know, I, I hope it's better in the, the more recent games, but... It's some of the, some of the flaws are pretty glaring. Although there was a Fresh Prince of Bel Air reference, which I imagine wasn't in the original Japanese, so that helps. You playing anything else, or did you play anything else? Um, I have Far Cry Three here. That's happening. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know how much time I'm going to get to commit to it because I'm also working on an article. I don't want to. I don't want to tip my hand. There's an article coming out next week on the site that I'm writing, and in order to write it, I played the game like a while ago. But I'm now I'm watching the anime of the game. The anime of Far Cry Three. Of another game that I'm oh. not talking. All right. And it's I I I'll I'll get into it next week. It, this is this is a really strange journey I've embarked on, and I don't know that I should have done this. So I'll save that one. We'll move we'll move on for now, but expect that next week. Ah, oh, jeez. So did John, you get did you get any Far Cry Three in then, or is it just like it's there, it's present, it calls to you? Just a little bit. Nothing. nothing I mean, I I stabbed a Komodo dragon. So. All right, that's cool. Uh, I mean, guys, I think we we firmly established that Far Cry Three is. The fucking tits. I don't know how much more there is to say about it, except maybe a spoilery discussion of the end. Yeah, I would. I would be interested in that. That's something that we can look forward to for a future episode. So, Johnny, did you play any PC games? I did actually. I managed to get a couple of games in. I like. I was really worried last night. I was like, "Fuck, I don't have any games to play." But then I was like, "Wait a minute, I played a fuck ton of games." Um, I finished Dishonored in the first place. I had completely forgotten about that. I finished it like last weekend. You know, well, not last weekend. I, I I think I finished it like actually after we did the podcast last week. But yeah, I finished it, and it's awesome. I love it. I love it so much. I want it. I want to hold it. I want to hug it. I want to take it to bed with me. I want to wake up and look into its face. We already established that you shouldn't have inter intercontinental relationships with Canadians. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and that's I, I believe- probably not gonna happen. Uh, where's Arcane Studios located? Uh, I think Arcane Studios is actually in France. So that, that probably shouldn't happen. Probably not. Although, so are, you know, they say some things about the French. Are you going to replay it to, the, to do everything a different way? or? I, I, well, I already did. I, you know, like, during the course of my playthrough, I, I did reduce, like, I, you know, I made myself promise that I wasn't going to be like, oh, I fucked that up, so I'm going to load it. But what I did wind up doing was replay sections of levels and be like, hey... I wonder if I did that differently and just, like, go back and experiment, basically get to a certain point in time and be like, oh, that was really cool. I can't believe I did that. What if I did it this other way? So then I went back and I would, like, wreck people's shit. And it it seamless, seamlessly excuse me, lets you do either thing, be like just a, a goddamn ghost or all the murder, all the murder. Like, it, it – most of the time whenever I encounter a game that, that, that focuses on stealth, um, there's usually a bias, you know, where it's like, we're an action game that has a stealth component, you know, like Far Cry 3, for example, we were just talking about, is a very heavy action game that has a stealth component. It's an undercooked stealth component. It works, but, I mean, it's 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 obviously kind of like... You know, not not as important to the game as, say, a, a Central Crux stealth game would be, like uh, one of the Splinter Cell games or the Thief games to get classic or Metal Gear Solid or uh, uh, even Dishonored. But uh, the way that Dishonored marries you being able to slip by almost completely and utterly unnoticed with destroying everybody. You know, like, you kind of have to choose, I guess, you know, like, uh, at some point in time, which way you really want to play the game in terms of the price of the upgrades that that you have available to you and which ones would be really useful for which way you're going to play the game. But I think it does a really decent job of, of both. So I finished that, and um, I just – just once. I mean, I, I, I don't really have time to replay many games these days, uh, so – uh, unfortunately, immediately afterwards, I uninstalled it and moved on. Uh, played a little bit more Sleeping Dogs. You know, that's happening pretty slowly. Um, played a little bit more Strike Suit Zero and actually Skyrim, because I'm trying to clean out my quest log and get everything done for when Dragonborn comes out, because um, I want to see if that's any good, because Morrowind, big fan. Um, but I did get a couple of new games in this week. Uh, one of them, The Cave. And the other one, Antichamber. Which one would you like to hear about first? Well, I, I believe, w- did Sean give The Cave a 7? I, I believe that was his review. Possibly. Very possibly. I, um, I I think it was in that realm. It was, I, I think, think, I think he, his, his general consensus was is that it was a flawed masterpiece or something. Uh, how, do, how, do, how do you feel? Well, I'm you know I'm not that far into it. I've only I've only played um, I think a little more than an hour at this point in time, but I'm immediately taken by the art style and also by the humor. Um, 
That is a uh, Gilbert and Double Fine production, correct? Yes, that's right. I, I mean, you know, like, and it's not, it's not really that. I was, I was a little surprised that um, Sean said an unlikely team up of Gilbert and Double Fine. I'm like, unlikely? No, 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 no. Because uh, Ron Gilbert gave Tim Schafer his first job in the industry. The two of them used to work at LucasArts together. You know, they did Maniac Mansion together. They did uh, mm. Monkey Island 2. Um, in fact, the Monkey Island 2 Special Edition actually features a commentary track with uh, Ron Gilbert and Tim Schafer both. Um, and it's it definitely hits that kind of um, – that, that humor, that uh, – that niche and i love it for that i love the art design too i mean it's i i can kind of see it sort of as being a a weirdly i don't want to say spiritual successor because that makes it sound like we're never going to get a psychonauts 2 but it, it feels as though it's pretty heavily influenced by psychonauts I've I've made peace with the fact that we're never going to get a psychonauts 2 don't even open that wound we will see how double fine adventure goes We'll see. I, I'm not hopeful. We'll see how Double Fine Adventure goes. <clears throat> and after that, I think we'll be qualified to say once and for all whether or not it's going to happen. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's pretty heavily influenced, at least stylistically, by... I mean, if you're not familiar with the premise of the cave, it's essentially about these eight characters. Um, at any point in time, or, or any time you play the game, you're controlling three of them, who have all come to this cave, who actually narrates the game. The cave narrates... Um, which is funny, actually. You know, I, I just gotta say, you know what the first thing that occurred to me when I heard that the game was called The Cave? And this is so completely arbitrary and stupid. What? How hard would that be to Google? Probably pretty hard. Like, when, with everything so like vigorously focus-tested and you know the publishers are all up everyone's ass to make sure everything's gonna meet all their fucking stupid criteria, you would think... That a name as generic as the cave would never get past the boardroom, but I guess that just speaks to the way that Double Fine just does things differently. Yeah, probably. In any case, the cave uh, grants like the deepest desires of those who manage to plumb its uh, insurmountable depths, and uh, it, it it seems as though each time you like you know. Uh, somebody enters the cave, it it winds up basically constructing a part of it to suit this character. So you're running around this underground cave, like, trying to fill your heart's desire. You know, find the one thing that this character really wants. And you're fleshing out the character's storylines, too. And there's a really wide variety of characters. There's a knight, there's a hillbilly, there's a time traveler, there's a scientist, there's a pair of twins. Um, ah, jeez. And more. So, you know, as, as you maneuver your way through the cave, it essentially forms itself to like tell these stories and and set up these uh, um scenarios that very specifically relate to uh your characters and each character has their own special ability and it's kind of like it it's kind of like um an adventure game light meets platformer <clears throat> where it is about like you know running around and like grabbing items and using items to like get the right thing done but each character can only carry one item at a time and because you're controlling three characters, you can kind of maneuver them so it's like, oh, so you have to position this guy by the fuse, and then this guy has to go pick up the wrench and then turn off the electricity so the first guy can grab the fuse and then move it over here and then plug this thing in. and You know, um, so it, it, it's, its narrative is very resemblant of an adventure game in terms that it, like, it presents you with puzzles that need to be solved. But then it plays... Very much like a platformer with a, a simple inventory mechanic. And because of that, you know, I feel that it doesn't really um, come a cropper of a lot of the inventory problems that adventure games do. Where it's like, if it's not nailed down, pick it up. I don't know if I need it, but I'll probably find some place to use it. Uh, you know, where you, you get to a puzzle and it's like, okay, I'm just going to use every single item I have on the guy guarding this door and see which one lets me through. You know, like, the, the items are very purposefully organized uh, in, in terms of what their capabilities are and what you might be able to do with them. There's a direction that it allows. And granted, that makes it kind of a simpler game, but that doesn't make it a worse game. Um and the other, yeah, yeah, so that's the cave. I mean, I haven't played it to completion yet. Uh, my The other game I played, Antichamber, 
makes no goddamn sense. Um, I'm intrigued already. Uh, right. Well, uh, there are there are like almost no. The only game that I can think of to even come close to comparing Antichamber to is Portal, because it is a it is a first person puzzler game that fails to adhere to the laws of physics to any logic. Um, even floor planning, it it doesn't it 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 does not fall victim to like this this game is so backwards and it's not antechamber in the sense of welcome mr brothsing witch please wait in the antechamber her ladyship will be out to see you in a jiffy it's antechamber as in like the opposite of chamber um in the first place, there's like there's absolutely no plot. It just it starts and you're standing in a room and it's like go team. Um, <clears throat> and then the whole world gets turned upside down and sideways at the same time. It's like it'll be like you'll wander into a room where there's like nothing, you know, and you wander into the middle and then there's this like writing that etches out on the ceiling and you like look up at the writing and it says don't look down and then you look down and the floor just opens up underneath you and, like it dissolves. And then you fall, and you land on a trampoline that will, like, uh, you know, but it's a trampoline platform, not a real trampoline, so it goes down, and then it pushes up. And if you jump when it pushes up and land again, it will push down more, and then you can, like, slide in underneath into this little room that doubles in on itself. It'll be like, it'll turn left, and you'll be like, okay, we're turning left, and then it immediately turns left again, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then again. again. And then again, and suddenly you discover that you're just walking around in a circle, and you're like, uh, okay. So you turn around, and then the hallway is straight, and you're like, oh, okay, I guess I go this way, and then you go straight. It's it like it is it is a puzzle game that basically makes you work against yourself by assuming everything has rules, and there's a time limit. Oh, a time limit? You yeah, get, that always bugs me. You get like you get ninety minutes per play to be like, go for it. And like, I don't know. I played this to a certain point in time where I got to what I believe is a representative of the developer's like working room. I got into a room that's like got all these developer notes on the wall on like pictures and all these like prototype three D models of things in the game and I'm like did I win? No. Okay. <laughs> it's it is like I mean seriously it's it's available on Steam right now. It uh, it just got released I think um, on the thirty first of January just at the end of last month. Uh, I know that that Skitch has been playing it. Skitch who, who occasionally writes for for Blistered Thumbs, uh, channel awesome personality, musician extraordinaire, um, has been been streaming some of it. It is like, man, it's it's backwards, but it's fun. Like it's it's really there's something about it that just you know it, it kind of rewards experimentation in this way where it's kind of like ha ha the rules don't apply here, and then you kind of have to think out of the box just in order to progress. You know, like it, it it's I don't even know what I'm doing why I'm there, what I'm looking for. And there are all these little cryptic drawings and signs. And Oh, man. Yeah, it just it does not adhere to anything that you would consider physics. So, I mean, you said that you walk into a room and there's writing on the ceiling that says don't look down. What if you don't look down? Do you just not progress? You have to basically go where it tells you? No, or actually, t- I, that was that looking down was not the way out of that puzzle. Oh, so you fucked up. I, I fucked up by looking down. The next time I looked up, it's like, don't look down. I'm like, okay, I won't. I will look sideways. And then it was like a hallway appears out of nowhere. And I'm like, this must be where I'm going. Oh, that's cool. I was I was a little worried that it was just like a one-trick pony kind of thing. No, but it sounds- no, it doesn't. Like, it doesn't deliberately abuse you. I mean, these puzzles have solutions in it. But it, it like, they are, they're not... They're not intuitive in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't operate on the same rule set that, like, Portal would, where it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to teach you how to use this, now solve this puzzle. So it is it is completely unlike Portal in that sense. But the only reason why I, sit, I can say it's, it's like Portal is because it's like, 
fucking puzzles, you know, in a first person sense that that are all about kind of like pushing buttons and using this weird gun that like takes and leaves bricks that you can use to like jam doors open and stop things from like moving and levers from catching and it's it's pretty interesting. It's a pretty interesting game. I I got to I have to give it more time. I've only played um about an hour of it. Um and and there were many a time when I was sitting there going, "What the fuck?" Um, huh? uh, uh, I don't where uh, uh, you know basically extend that to about a 60 minute long series of incomprehensible noises and you'll you'll get a good idea of what it what it was like to listen to me play this game I, I got it I, I, th- I think I kind of understand what you're going for it's, it seems like something that would be hard to get across <laughs> in it, so many words it, you kind of just got to do it be, it kind of has to be experienced i mean you know i'm i'm fairly certain there must be footage of it up on youtube by now or something like that you know anybody i, I, be, I, I believe video games awesome has a, a playthrough on blister thumbs right now they do they do actually you should go check that out it's it's a pretty singular game there's there's not quite anything like it that, that immediately jumps to mind yeah we wasted a lot of time you should just go watch that video yeah leon tell me about your video games uh, I only played two. Um, one was Super Mario Sunshine. I just I played it, uh, albeit briefly. Uh, the other game that I, man, I don't have anything new to say about that. Um, the other game that I'm I'm playing pretty heavily uh, is actually uh, my favorite game of all time, and uh, I had not played it in about 15 years, but I'm playing it again. Uh, it is Final Fantasy VI. Um, it's great. It's great. You know what's fun? Pressing fight and pressing magic, and pressing item, and pressing special, and not going through some sort of stupid, overwrought, too elaborate, to, it's so elaborate that it's complicated uh, fighting system that feels more like I'm setting up rules rather than participating in it, and it's Final Fantasy twelve and everything after. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love it a lot. Um I hadn't, uh, without getting into too many details, I hadn't played in a long time because I, I sort of associate a bad memory with it. But I'm over that now. I'm a grown-ass man, and uh, I'm playing it, and it's awesome. Uh, the music is great. Everyone needs to... This is seriously the best music soundtrack of any game ever. I, 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 I defy you to say and uh, think of one that is better. Um, if, if I never played that, and also, no. It's got uh, a pretty, yeah, it I, has a pretty kick-ass soundtrack, though. That... that I... I no, it, there, there's nothing more beautiful than than Terra's theme ever in history of. No, that's like if you go to my if you go to my iTunes, there's like a little like column for times played. Awakening from Final Fantasy VI is, is easily number one by like a hundred plays. Okay, so right. yeah, I, I agree with you, though, Leon. I just like trolling him. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's it's I, I'm enjoying it, and the, the amazing thing is, and even though I had like I said, I hadn't played in a very very long time, never in my adulthood. Um, I remember what to do pretty much step by step. I don't remember every single twist of the plot, but I, once everything gets going, I'm like, oh, yeah, I have to go over here. Oh, yeah, there's an elixir in this in this clock. Um, it's it's actually kind of amazing how it, and, and, and you'd think that would kind of ruin it for me because, you know, I always know what to do. But it's actually making this sort of move along at a pace where I'm not frustrated, and I kind of appreciate that. It feels new because I hadn't played it in a long time. But it also is familiar enough that I'm not racking my brain about what to do next uh, syndrome. That's what I call any JRPG or, or game where it's not immediately known what you're supposed to be doing, and you just kind of have to fiddle around until you accidentally stumble on things. Uh, so I don't have to deal with that right now. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Uh, and, and normally what I do, when I, past, I think past year or two, uh, when I played video games... Um, because I'm, I'm kind of busy and, and I just it, this is just sort of the way things are. I usually just play for 15 minutes to a half an hour of, of games, and then I'd stop, and two days later I'd pick something up again. Um, I'm playing pretty solid hours on Final Fantasy VI. I played a few hours, actually a few hours of gameplay this week, which is a, a big deal for me. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's there's no real reason not to play Final Fantasy VI. I mean, it's a ve- I mean, if you have a a console, chances are you can probably download it. There are also less black and white ways in which to play it. 
Um, so, yeah, it's kind of great. I, I, I feel like this is the game I'm going to be playing for a few weeks now, so I'm sorry, but this is probably all I'm going to be saying for a few weeks whenever you ask me what I'm playing. I'm playing Final Fantasy VI. I'm at the part where, um, not early in the game, but early-ish in the game, where you get to that point where you sort of, the, the party splits in three, and you can you can sort of choose uh, which one you want to do first, either the locks scenario or the uh, the one with Terra and, and Bannon and Edgar, or the one with uh, Saban. I'm doing the Saban one first, um, because I think that this is the ghost train coming up. So, yeah, it's great. Dude, the, the ghost train is baller as fuck. <laughs> yeah, the ghost train is kind of awesome. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to uh, su- suplexing the ghost train, as is, uh, as I, I'm known to do. Uh, so, there you go. Yeah. I think I said before that Chrono Trigger is the most perfect JRPG, but I think Final Fantasy VI is, is more dear to me for like personal reasons. It's there, obviously there's like you know there is exploits and things in the in the game that are programmed into pretty much every version of it, and some new some newer versions even have different glitches. So it's it's not quite as perfectly built, but it's it, it's so good. Yeah, it, it, it it's really something special. So uh, that's that's the game I'm playing, and the, probably the game I will be playing uh, almost exclusively for the next few weeks until I am done and uh, I get the big sort of black and white ending, and then the color part that's always good, and then I am sad. That that is the thing that will happen. Oh, and then the book comes up. Okay, I, anyway, I'm, I'm spoiling it for myself by remembering it somehow. So uh, I'm, I'm done now. I think I think that one of the things that Final Fantasy VI has over Chrono Trigger is the strength of its characters. Yep, um, I'm, I'm with you on that one. One of the things that, that bothered me the most about Chrono Trigger was the si- silent protagonist. Mm. Uh, now, I think that there's a tasteful way to do the silent protagonist, and then there's like a, a terrible way to do a silent protagonist. At any point in time where you have secondary characters interacting with the main character and then speaking for them, mm-hmm. that's that's horrible. Well, I mean, I think it's it's a stylistic choice. I think Chrono Trigger is kind of like from the the Dragon Quest school of JRPG making. It's kind of prototypical. It's not about the the inner drama or the psychological journeys of the characters. I think it's just a different a different take on it. But I, I definitely I prefer Final Fantasy VI. I just I, I, what all I'm saying is that I don't you know at any point in time where you have a character being like, isn't that right, player? Dot dot dot. Yeah. You're right. Maybe we should try doing this instead. And it's like, why didn't you just fucking have him say that? <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you on that. I, I genuinely don't like uh, silent protagonists in, uh, in, in games like this. In, in The Legend of Zelda, it kind of, it's kind of okay. But with Chrono Trigger, the, the, the thing about it is oh, there are all these other characters talking very uh, talking a lot and interacting with each other and forming bonds and friendships. It is a very and, verbal game. Yeah, and, and Chrono... He, you know, he, he forms this attachment to uh, to a few different characters, but we don't really connect with it at all. And you know, without getting in, well, I, all right, I'll, I'll get into some spoilers here for some people who still haven't played this game from the '90s. Um, he dies, but you can bring him back. Um, but you don't have to, and that's the thing: you can beat the game right after he dies. If, if if you are leveled up enough and, and want to do it that way. He is not integral to the plot. He's like, and and since he's supposed to be the main character, that's sort of weird. I mean, in Final Fantasy VI, Shadow can die, and and it, you know the game can play out almost exactly the same. And but he's Shadow. He's he's a very minor character, even though I like him a lot. Who has very little interactions with the other characters, except for Realm? Except he won't acknowledge his parentage. And uh, anyway, um, <laughs> stop <laughs> getting remembering. All, but getting anyway, all upset about yeah, this. But um, but uh, in, in Chrono Trigger, I mean, I I, I really hate it because hate it because every time you have to, he has to do something important. You just say yes or no, and it's like, oh, okay, well that's. That's for sure is significant. Well, you have to give me a big rousing speech right before you save the world, okay? You have to be Samwise Gamgee in Two Towers and, and give me a big beautiful speech right before things right as things get dark, but maybe things will be better. I'm sorry, you, you can't you can't be that silent of a protagonist and have me care about you. It just doesn't work like that. Even Link says ah every once in a while. <laughs> Why can't you say ah? You know, I, I 
I'm now not... I'm thinking of now I'm thinking about like a Chrono Trigger remake where Chrono has like a really pronounced personality. You know, there's there's ROM hacks uh, for for games like this. I wonder if someone yeah. someone actually went back and just added dialogue for Chrono and just had, <laughs> had to speak really eloquently. Oh, I was just thinking go the opposite direction, make him like speak in Ebonics or something, <laughs> <laughs> like super oh. ghetto. That would be amazing. <laughs> super ghetto. I hope. I hope somebody went back and made a ROM hack that actually has him, like, being acknowledged as a mute, and he has to mime out his answers to everything. <laughs> that, that I, would, I could live with that. I actually uh, was uh, debating who was the best character uh, in Chrono Trigger with uh, Pushing Up Roses on Twitter uh, a few days ago, and uh, she says Luca, and I said, no, Frog. Yeah, uh, but it's frog all the way. Yeah, but you know, well, but, Max, Magus or or Magus. Well, they are, they are they have the same they have they, they share an arc. I know so they I share an they, arc, yeah. but I mean they are different characters. Yeah, that's true. I think it depends on whether or not you recruit the one. You know what I'm saying? Because Austin's yeah. really scared to spoil it up here. Yeah. Okay. If you haven't played Chrono <laughs> Trigger by now, there you have a problem. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you haven't played Chrono Trigger, we need to talk. And the thing, of, and and going going back to the uh, the comparison of characters uh, between Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger, I mean, it, I, I, there there you say some characters share an arc, but the thing about Chrono Trigger is there's there's like three character stories. There's Luca, you know, kind of. There's Frog's arc with with Magus or Magus. I think I always said Magus, um, and that, because that's how they said it in Gargoyles, and um, uh, Robo has kind of like a thing where he learns to kind of be semi human. He, he goes he goes love. through the he goes through the data arc of like trying to be human. But but he it, learns to love and then they play never gonna give you up. But the thing is but the thing is about that, and there's like there's like three characters who you kinda get to know and the rest suck because Isla you don't almost know almost nothing about her and Chrono is nothing. Um I, apparently a lot of Isla's stuff was cut out. Well, there. You, well, whether whether it was meant or not, I mean, it, it's just yeah, not yeah. in there. And and but in Final Fantasy VI, it's like everyone goes through a thing, through the whole thing. It's like really operatic. There's this huge cast of characters, and they all go through these sort of uh, long journeys. They, they, there's like a hero's journey for every character in that, and it's just kind of cool. And at the end of the game, again, I'm, I'm spoiling this for myself by remembering it so much. But at the end of the game, right before you fight uh, Kefka, every character tells. Kefka, what they've learned on this journey. It's amazing. It's like Kefka says something like, what are you even fighting for? And they all they all say what they learned over the past 40 hours of this game very briefly, except for Mog, who who, who has all, no character arc. He's just, he's just <laughs> cute. He's, I don't know exactly what he says to you. He says, all of my friends are here. And that's it. And if you have Amaro in, or Gogo in the, the party, they don't say anything. <laughs> but, but 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 everyone but they're 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 characters you don't even have to pick up. But everyone else says a thing, you know. They're all they're it's 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 like I, I said this on an episode of Heart of Gaming once. But I like a I like a JRPG where a group of people get together and fight for, to save the world and friendship. You know that that's kind of what that's kind of what I want out of this these games. And uh, Final Fantasy VI just delivers that. Damn, I'm, I'm, I, I'm again I'm, I'm spoiling this whole experience, this whole retro experience for myself by remembering every single cool thing that happens in this game. I'm gonna stop talking about this now. So. Don't worry, I'll roofie you after the podcast. Thank you. <clears throat> You're gonna do that anyway. <laughs> well, now I have a good reason to. I actually want to say one more thing on the Final Fantasy VI. I think I probably said this before, but I always said that when me and Taylor argue about what's better, Persona 3 or Persona 4, I always say that Persona 3 is like Final Fantasy VI and Persona 4 is like Final Fantasy VII in the sense that the, the one series, the, the one set is more popular. Like People always remember Cloud and Sephiroth, and they always remember fucking Teddy. But but I think the other games are better. I think Final Fantasy VI and Persona 3 are the better ones that kind of preceded the popularity. And they both share that thing at the end where you get to, you get to the top of the tower in Persona 3 and they're like, our friendship combined! And, <laughs> and they save the world. And it's just like, you can't, you can't defeat the power of love. And it's just like, oh God, like so many people are dead. What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's the other thing I, I love about Final Fantasy VI. It's like... And I, I, I like that they, they eventually, you know, come together and, 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 and form a bond and, and beat the bad guy. But they lost. They lost the fight. Kefka destroyed the world. All the mil- I mean, millions of people must have died. There's no, yeah. there's no going back from that. They, be, they beat one guy. 
and and he's not going to kill any more people because he's dead. But this it's over. I mean, the world is ruined. Nothing is ever going to be the same again. And that I kind of like that. I kind of like that Kefka is the villain who won. In I the feel game. like that's that's the hipster thing to say. Is like everyone looks at Baratheon. You're like, yeah, but Kefka actually won. Like at this point, it might even be a cliche, but it is awesome. I, I just I feel it's true. I mean, I I like Sephiroth because they tried to make him a semi deep ish character where you almost sympathize with him. But you know what? I'm okay with Kefka as the insane Saturday morning cartoon villain who just nukes the world with magic. Yep. Both great. I, I do love Final Fantasy VI. I think you might have, you may have, I need, to, I need to meditate on the relationship between Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI now, because I don't know, you guys were persuasive as fuck. I'll think about it. Think right. about the silent protagonist. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. do we, you guys want to hit these news stories? Let's right move on first? to the news segment. God, Ladies we're, and gentlemen. We're an hour in, but yeah. No, we're not an let's, hour in. We're, we're we have 45. A, we had a warm up. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead. All right, so uh, I guess we'll start with Steam. Uh, and this this news story just uh, I, I guess it just broke today. Although it's it's whether or not it's actually news is kind of debatable. And that uh, somebody else has decided to go digging through the Steam registry. Yes, the Steam registry that has said in the past that games like Final Fantasy VII are coming to Steam, uh, and found a whole list of potential possible new releases. Some of them are not really that. Um, surprising, considering that they've been greenlit, like La Mulana's on there, Octo Dad, the Dadliest Catch. If we ever, if we ever change our opening theme song for this podcast, it's going to be the Octo Dad theme. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm down with that. Uh, Yogg Ventures, which has also been greenlit, uh, Dyad, uh, which I think was actually only announced in response to this thing being uh, 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 dropped. But there's a couple of other titles on there that are sort of like, oh, is, really? Oh, okay. Uh, so, for example, Halo 2 and 3 are in there. Angry Birds Space. Second Life. The King of Fighters 2002 Unlimited Match. And the King of Fighters 98 Unlimited Match. Resident Evil Revelations. Cut the Rope. Um, in the first place, yeah, is, is this news? I'm not even sure this is news. Because, I mean... I, th- I think... More than video game news, it's kind of like tech news because people are kind of freaking out about Microsoft and Windows 8. I think if they were to start releasing their their games both on the Xbox platform and PC like simultaneously, like all future Halo games, I think they might benefit from that. Well, I don't know. They have all but given up on games for Windows Live. Everybody with half a brain in their head who plays PC games at this point in time has realized that games for Windows Live is nothing but a, a pustule blight on the face of PC gaming. It's it's awful. It's a terrible system. I agree. And yet studios continue to try and release games for it. But if I'm saying if you're if you are Microsoft, do you keep the, your your upcoming console fenced do you, off do you from your struggling? Your <laughs> well, maybe I'm just saying maybe they they integrate Windows 8 and the 720 in such a way as as to encourage people to use both. I, I don't. I I. Mm. You know, I I would believe that if if I was convinced that the people at Microsoft had any vision. Um, I think the the very way that Windows 8 wound up being released. Um, demonstrates that they do not. Um, the fact that it's, uh, you know, like this proprietary app store, I realize that you can still, like, you know, you can download Steam on Windows 8, you can install what you want and things like that, but, I mean, they, they are obviously trying to be more controlling of the medium. They are they are trying to be more locked on. Uh, uh, they're trying to be more like Apple, which frightens me. You know, it's why I have not adopted Windows 8, because I don't appreciate them moving in that direction. Exactly. The, re- the reason I use Windows is because I don't want to use Apple. <laughs> Why are you going to be the thing I didn't want to use? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, it, people in the industry have, industry have have repeatedly spoken out about the the steps that Microsoft has taken in creating Windows 8 and how damaging. Gabe Newell himself, I mean, if you're going to listen to anybody in the PC gaming sphere, I think it ought to be Gabe Newell. He certainly has the cred, you know, he's got the cash to back it up. They are more experimental. They have been more faithful to the PC gaming crowd than, than any other like market influence. And, and Gabe Newell is, is oh, yeah, Windows 8, damaging. I'm with him. 
the more you try and lock it down as a system, the more people are going to flee from it. And the idea that Steam is going to be participating with Microsoft, although it would like certainly up Microsoft's cred to me, um, I, I feel disinclined to believe that that's the case. So you don't give them the credit that they would actually do something that half decent? Like, I you know. don't think that Microsoft has the sense to actually admit that they've lost the like the the domination on the market that they want to acquire. You know, like they're not going to have Xbox Live on a PC. They're not going to have it. You're not going to log on to your desktop and get advertised to. Oh my God! Can you imagine? That's, I mean, you know, you would go turn on your Xbox 360 right now and, and tell me that that's not a giant fucking billboard. I try to avoid it now, honestly. I, when it came, the last generation rolled around, the 360 was the first console I pick up, but uh, I, I try not to use it if at all possible if, if I can play something on PS3. So could, that, you imagine, could you imagine turning your computer on and being confronted with that? Not being able to use an ad blocker, I have mixed feelings about using ad blockers because, you know, like, uh, game sites like Blistered Thumbs, they get their revenue from things like that, you know, but I perfectly, I perfectly support your right to use it, you know, not being able to do that even, like, logging onto your computer, sticking your password in, your desktop shows up, and then right in front of your wallpaper, there's a brand new ad for the Schick 7. Seven Blades! Fuck! Shave your face right now! <laughs> uh, do you remember, like, Saturday Night Live, like, in the 90s, made, like, a parody commercial where it was, like, Five Blades or something, and now we're, like, up to that? Yeah. I'm, I'm back down to one. I got me a straight razor. My, my new Badger brush arrived in the mail today. If I take care of this thing, I'm not gonna need to buy another razor for the rest of my life. I'm surprised you're you're here. I assumed you'd just slit your throat sometime during the week. Actually, I'm finding it reasonably easy to shave with this thing. It's fantastic. It, it also so, makes me feel pretty manly. I think I said that. So yeah. So uh, before we before we leave Valve and Steam, I think there was one more thing you guys wanted to touch on. There is one more thing actually, and this touches on a, a story that we spoke about actually a, a couple of months ago. I'm I'm fairly certain, and that's Valve is currently being sued. Um, they are being sued by the Federation of German Consumer Organizations, um, initialized as the VZVB, because the Germans spell Federation with a V. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Nine. <clears throat> uh, they are being they are being sued. Why you might ask? Well, it would be in your right to ask, and I tell you, they're being sued because consumers are not allowed to sell the games they buy. Now, uh, this does touch on, uh, as I said, uh, last July, the Court of Justice for the European Union ruled that the trading of used software licenses is legal and that the authors and distributors of these software licenses can't oppose resale. Now, I don't think that Valve has instituted the changes yet, and, and I'm fairly certain that the, the, the VZVB that this legal action is probably basing itself off of that ruling. Uh, but they are, they are basically trying to use Valve and Steam as an example to other online distributors, digital distributors, that, you know, it's, uh, it's got to happen and it's got to happen soon because legal stuff. I mean, we did speak about this earlier. What, can everyone remind me what you thought about reselling digital games? Um, you know, I'm I, I I suppose I'm for it, but we we spoke about how exactly that would work. You know, like I suppose you should be allowed to sell your property. Again, I have mixed feelings about the 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 the, the used game market. We've talked about this in the past in terms of. I feel that when a customer walks in, you know, when someone with money walks in, you have a potential customer, that money is going to go to one of two places. It's either going to go to the store that you're buying the used game from, or it's going to go in part to the publisher and the developer and get you, therefore, support for that, that product that, that you like. Um, but the freedom... Yeah, the freedom to do it should be there, absolutely. Um, but we did wonder about how exactly this was going to work. I mean, are you going to do? You, are are we going to resell licenses back to Steam at reduced rates? Is that money going to come to you? Uh, is that going to be? Is it going to go directly to your Steam wallet? You know, as opposed to actual the actual trading of of money. Would these? Do you, do you suppose that these conditions would satisfy? 
I mean, like, you know, if, if you could sell a game to a friend, they'd be like, oh, I'll pay you in Steam dollars. Then to, like, you know, use those Steam dollars to buy other games and things like that. Because when people sell, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you bring a used game back to, like, GameStop or something like that, and you're like, yeah, take my used game, they don't give you cash, do you? They, they, don't they give you, like, trade-in value? I think you get, like, half of half if you get cash. Like, if you bring a $60 game, they'll give you 30 in credit and, like, 15 cash. It, it does sort of stand to reason that people go with the credit. I, can, I, 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 I would if, assume. If Valve winds up forcing people to do this, or, you know, not forcing, but if, if sorry, if Valve gets their arm twisted and is, is forced to do this, I could see them doing something similar. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always consumer, consumer advocacy, but I, this seems like a no-win situation if they are forced to, because I think we see less sales, because that you, you could almost reach a point where you could you could basically get games for free. If you buy them on sales, they go back up and then you sell them or something. So I don't know how they would even handle that. It's It seems like a very complicated problem, and I, I don't really mind... Uh, Welcome in, back, Leon. In, thank you. In principle, I I agree that we should be able to sell our our, our games back, even even to people in di- di- digital form. But the problem is, it, it's kind of like the logistics of it. I mean, it, 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 with with Steam, it feels like they're holding our game for us. Like, and how do I? How does that work? Because it, it, would it somehow be disappear from my my computer if I sell it from someone? I mean, the way Steam is set up, I just don't. They'd have to like reorganize the whole thing, wouldn't they? Presumably, if you sold it to someone, you would lose the license. It would it right. would exit your account. Right, and it, it's just they they would they would pretty much have to it, they would have to create a system in which to sell used games, and all and I I just don't know if it's entirely their. See, see, I'm conflicted because I, I think we should be able to sell used games, but I don't know if they have to provide that for us. I mean, it's like it's like EA sells sells me a game. I don't know. I buy a game from EA. Um, they don't have to. The company itself doesn't have to buy it back from me if I want to sell it to them. You know, it's 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 kind it's kind of a, a gray area, I guess, because just because of the way uh, digital distribution works. I think actually that's a pretty good point. Like maybe Steam should allow you to like trade games with friends. Well, they already, you know, they they do they they do have the infrastructure for a trading system already built in, really. Like just one for one. I mean, I know there's like the gifting thing. No, no, no. I mean, like you know, there's there's the item trading and things like that. Things that oh, yeah, yeah. bind themselves to your account. So that those those things exist. So they could just expand that. That may be where they have to go. I mean, if, if there's any legal traction in terms of suing a company because they don't let you sell your software licenses, it may be the quickest way out of legal action for them. I think that's a I think that's a fair compromise. And yeah, that's where I'm that's where I'm planting the flag for this for today. Yeah, yeah, could be done. Could be done. Yeah, the, I think the trouble does get in there when we start like uh, affixing monetary value. That'll that that will be trouble. I feel. Anyway, speaking of monetary value. You guys hear about GameStop? It's of course you heard about breeze. GameStop. We, we've all read breeze. the story. <laughs> well, um, what I'm talking about uh, is GameStop uh, basically establishing, creating, uh, sinking their, their hard-earned cash into a $10 million fund to help independent developers in free-to-play mobile. Uh, the fund is apparently going to be managed by uh, a former Zynga uh, GM, uh, and excuse me, I'm way going to mispronounce this name, uh, Panayoti Haratetos, very possibly. Um, so in hot potatoes. In hot potatoes. So uh, basically, GameStop, as as a uh, as a retailer, is attempting to sink some money into their future as either a, a publisher. Uh, or even um, even possibly a developer. How's that for vision? I, I think GameStop's also made some recent strides in like the digital market. I think they're they're very interested in branching out, and I, obviously people have been ringing the death toll there for uh, de- the death of brick and mortar sales, the, the the demise of GameStop. So I mean, it makes sense for them to do so. I'm I'm curious if it's going to pan out though because I mean when you when you think about digital, when you think about mobile, you don't think I'm going to the store. Usually people just do that from their devices. 
Well, you know, surprise story. One of the games that I picked up actually on Steam this week uh, called Retrovirus. It's a six-axis 3D game, rather like Descent, if, if anybody remembers playing Descent. Um, Retrovirus was actually originally uh, an attempt at a Kickstarter game. I backed it. It did not make its funding quote, and I thought that was going to be pretty much the last I heard of Retrovirus. Do you know who picked them up? GameStop did. GameStop actually used some funding that they channel into indie development in order to get Retrovirus published. And it, it just came out on Steam. It's, it's a $20 title, $17.99 uh, on sale right now. Um, but because I had kickstarted the game, I was on their mailing list, right? And they were like, oh, hey, guess who's decided to actually make sure that we finish making the game and actually wind up publishing? Oh, GameStop! I was like, what? So yeah, they they have actually been they they've been doing this. There's there's been a, a little bit of assurances that they remain uh, in in the sales of games market. If they get if they become like a big part in like the mobile or indie scene, do you think people will? Do you think it'll become like less stigmatized? Because right now, as far, as far as I'm concerned, GameStop is like something that we can assume everyone hates. Well, I mean, you know, some time ago, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, uh, they bought Impulse off of Stardog Games. Uh, and as a platform, it, it still has a lot of problems. But, I mean, you know, they're obviously doing their due diligence. They're, they're putting their homework in. They're, they're, they're trying to carry the flag into the next generation of, of game sales. You know, but I, I do think that that if they become a little bit more, you know, developer indie friendly, because I mean, a lot of the hate basically comes from uh, the margins that that we're all pretty keenly aware of, you know, and the fact that yeah, used game sales at GameStop, 100% of that revenue winds up going back to GameStop. If they wind up using some of that revenue to actually, you know, help smaller developers or you know even help get games get made to publish who knows you know would that i think would that smooth their image out some absolutely i think it would yeah it makes them more interactive in in the games industry as people who love and produce games as opposed to people who just profit from them <laughs> leon's like i no, I, I, no, I, I i totally heard you i just don't have any further thoughts at this time okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> leon's like the defense rest <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right. So, I mean, do, do you guys have any? I mean, it's it's weird because we've all kind of had this image of GameStop, and now they're doing all kinds of strange things. I I think it would be a shame if they just just quietly accepted the death of physical retail and just died. So I think this is the best possible avenue for them to pursue, whether or not it works out. Yeah, rather than rather than uh, limiting your business or just clinging to old guards, you know. Like, when I say limiting, I mean, like, you know, closing physical stores down and going exclusively digital or, you know, um, it, it, it seems to me that that a hybrid would, would obviously reach probably the, the best middle ground for them. Because I know I get on my high horse about how digital distribution is the future and I can't understand why people line up in the middle of the night to buy, like, a midnight copy and then go home and blah, 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 but... You know, I understand that people want collections. I don't want a collection. I have a collection. It takes up way too much space. I'm 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 done with having physical goods. That's my thing. But I understand that people still want it. You know, for GameStop to just be like, well, fuck you guys. There's no money in discs anymore. Seems a bit premature at this point in time. But I think they can see the writing on the wall that... You know, I mean, there's been idle talk about there being, like, secondhand sale, you know, measures in future consoles, about, you know, um, them limiting uh, the actual capability of secondhand games, and whether or not they, the new consoles are going to be exclusively digital distribution, and if you have to buy everything from a Microsoft store or a Sony store, or... So they're obviously covering their asses. Yeah, I think it's it's a smart move to at least start making the transition. You have to have the the buffer there in case Microsoft or Sony goes off their fucking nut and decides to do a no used games all digital platform, which they won't. But yeah, you need the groundwork. Yeah, it's smart. I don't think it's going to change anyone's minds right out of the gate. And I, you know, none of us are mobile gamers, but just because it doesn't affect us personally doesn't mean that we can't appreciate the effort. Okay. Yep. Yep. And on that note, man, fuck mobile gaming. 
Angry Birds this. I, Angry you, can't, Birds, you can't see it, but I'm grabbing myself in an obscene area of my body. <laughs> Angry Birds is fine. It's inoffensive. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. It's like Tetris or Pong. It's harmless. I feel like I haven't said as very much during this episode, uh, so I would like to share a story uh, from my day to basically pad out the parts where I'm talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gotta make your quota. Exactly. I feel like I haven't reached quota at all. Normally, I feel like the show is like 40% Johnny, 40% Austin, and 20% me. But this week, I'm like 10. And so I really feel like I have to say something. Um, two separate students in two separate classes today wrote swastikas on their test paper. Um, I don't know why this happened. Uh but I, but it, 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 either they know each other really well and they're Nazis, or this is like a trend in the school, and I'm just noticing it now. So that creeped me out. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to take a bold stance here. I don't care who I piss off by saying it, but uh, I don't like Nazis. I think I, 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 I don't like them. I don't like their ways. Uh, I wouldn't go to the Nazi part of town at night. Um, I don't like their music. Uh, Do they have a Nazi part of town? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm making a horrible reference. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, that was weird today. Um, I feel like it's like the Da Vinci Code and you've stumbled <laughs> upon a secret neo-Nazi society. Oh, and another horrible thing. Um, a student, uh, another student was writing um, on her uh, or her paper uh, the very many ways you can say the N word. Um, it turns <laughs> it turns out twelve. Um, so that was my day. I don't know what's with this school. It uh, sounds extremely racist. It does. Um, the the staff liked me. I, I went there basically to fill in for someone for the day, as I am known to do. And uh, the staff liked me. They said, well, you know, you really kept the kids in line today, you know. And I said, well, I used to be like a regular classroom teacher. And like, oh, okay, well, I, I might need you back here. I'm like, okay, all right, just just tone down the horrible overt racism in your students <laughs> and maybe we'll talk. But I'm a little afraid right now to be here. Um, they might find out that I'm distantly black. Uh, and I don't know what they're going to do to me. So, um yeah, that was my day, and uh, that's what the story I wanted to share with you. So, How I old were these kids? I gotta know. They're middle, they're middle school students. That means nothing to me. Okay. Do they, not, they don't have middle oh, school. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. They're 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 uh, almost, but not quite, in high school. They're one or two years before that. They're like twelve and thirteen. Ah, uh, I see. And no, Austin, they don't have middle school in Canada. Old old enough not to do that. Old enough to know better. I mean, you would like hope a, so. If, like, a seven-year-old, like, wrote a swastika on their test, then I'd be like, you just don't know what that means, or maybe you're Hindu. But, um, no, that's, you You know what, what what's up with that. So I don't I don't know why that you think that's okay. And I, I, I had a problem with it. I, I didn't let it slide either. I know I'm only there for the day. I'm like, you, you need to get rid of that on your paper right now. That's completely inappropriate. Uh, I, 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 I was not going to let that be on the paper that I give to the regular teacher to say, here's the test papers. By the <laughs> way, you might want to watch out for little Timmy. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, I mean right now it's this but one day I'm going to come up to the school and there's going to be a burning cross on, so so there we uh, go ladies and gentlemen Baltimore good for traffic disruptions and also swastikas <laughs> also swastikas did I tell you guys the story about how I met the like the earnestly racist kid at the at a New Year's party no but I need to hear it no, when, you, just, when you say earnestly, you mean like fully conscious that he was racist and very happy to be so? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, oh. It was uh, this past New Year's. I was just at a party. I was actually – some of my friends there, um, <laughs> Venezuelans, so like no one there spoke English. Um, I, I speak enough Spanish to talk to them. But their, their next-door neighbors came over, and they're just white people. And they have a kid, and he's just like, hey, uh, I hate black people. I just want to let you know that up front. Um, <laughs> no context or anything. He's just like, I, I think they're stupid. I, I don't want them near me. I don't want like he just. I was just like, oh, how, okay. how old was I, this kid? 
I I I guess like thirteen, fourteen. Too old, too old to, to yeah yeah. You should know better by now. Doesn't count. Yeah. But like that was how he introduced himself. He wasn't like, "Hi, my name is blank." He was just like, "Hey, I just want to let you know, uh, uh, white power." <laughs> I was just if you get so, so much accustomed to introducing yourself like that, you better be prepared to lose a good deal of your natural teeth during li- your lifetime. <laughs> I mean, I kind of, I've seen a, quite a bit of racism being from the rural South, but I've never seen someone be so quite upfront about it. Just like, <laughs> yeah, normally, normally I hate people, black people. <laughs> yeah, normally people don't, don't don't go out of their way to tell you they're a racist. They either hide this fact or they think they're not. They always, it, it's always just look. I'm not racist, but Chinese people smell bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's. It threw me. I actually, I appreciated the honesty, but I would prefer it if we had not met. Yeah. <laughs> did you get to his name before he did that? Because the way you make it sound is you make it sound as though he was like, hey, before I tell you who I am, I need to grab <laughs> a fact about my personality. Now that you know I hate black people, my name is Daquan. <laughs> no, I, I don't even remember if he ever even gave his name. Jesus. Hi. Hi, Duquan. You are a wide awake nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so on on that note, right? Yeah, we can go. I guess. <laughs> just drop the mic, walk away. <laughs> yeah, just, let's just be very Chris Rock about this. And after Next discussing week, after oh. discussing racism, just drop the mic and walk off. Yeah. Next, next, next week on, is going to be... <laughs> on a motion picture is worth a thousand words, we look at the descriptive video track to American History X. <laughs> That's a good movie. I just, I just rewatched that. I, I saw that when I was young, and I, I rewatched it like three or four weeks ago. It is quite good. It 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 um it it's like it's one. Of, it it feels like the best made for TV movie ever about yeah, about racism. It's a little preachy, but Edward Norton looks really good without a shirt. Like I'm not even going to say no homo. <laughs> Like he, I have, he definitely worked out for the role. Good, good for him. It's a shame he had to do it with a giant swastika on, on his chest. That sort of yeah. mars things a little. But, um, but yeah. like you couldn't hang a poster of him in your room. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's Photoshop, really, Photoshop, yeah, the, guys. Because if you really love American History X, or you really loved Edward Norton's chest in that movie, you're not yeah. allowed to hang a poster of that because he's just got racist tattoos and shit on his trim. He's so dreamy. Just ignore <laughs> Ignore the racism. <laughs> just put a Band-Aid over the photo. I think, like, I think he got an ouchie. I think next week should be the Leon cast, so we, should, we can make up for the deficiency of Leon with him speaking like 80%. Yep, yep. That's the plan, Leon. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll do my best. But I, but I only have so many swastika stories. <laughs> yeah, I think they are in short supply these I'm, days. I'm going to have to save some up over the course of the week and just blow up. Because <laughs> this was just today, is what I'm saying. This was just today. This kind of stuff, there's always a weird story every day. So I'll try to save up my stories. Sounds good. All right. I'm, I'm leaving now. <laughs> Bye, Leon. That's our Leon. Did it, did it, did it, did it.